Welcome back to Heroes Next Door. Thank you all for watching. Today we're in Exxon PA. We're going to be doing the West Wyland Police Department. Coming into the township building here, the police department is attached to the township building, but I want to take a real quick second and talk about the township building. This is designed to house a lot of their administrative staff. If I come over to the board here, they have the administrative staff, finance, human resources, permits and regulations and inspections, uh, zoning, obviously the police department that we're going to go see, trash and recycling. So this whole thing is to set up to do all the business of West Whiteland Township. But we're going to very specifically talk about the police department and we're going to meet up with a guy in there. So let's go take a look. Here's next door wants to put out a thank you to everybody that's been watching. If you're new to the channel, this is going to be unique for you because this is not a fire station. It's a police station. Normally we do station cribs and station rigs at fire EMS. This is our first police station. The reason we wanted to do this is because they are part of the heroes next door with us. We are a group of first responders. They're the ones that are going to be out there to help us protect uh, the neighborhood. So doing a station cribs for them is just as important as doing a firehouse. This is a police station and they got a lot of cool stuff here. So let's go take a look. So as we come into the department, I'm going to run into one of my good friends, Tom Evans. Thank you for inviting us in. Absolutely, Mike. So Tom was very key in getting us into the police department. He invited us. We've been talking about it for a couple of months. Uh, I finally got the opportunity to come in. But before we get started, tell the audience who you are. What, what do you do here? So, yeah, uh, my name's Tom Evans, and um, I'm assigned to patrol and uh, one of the patrol supervisors. All right, cool. So um, this is divided into two different sections. You have an upper level and a lower level. Most of the stuff is on the lower level, but what do you have up here? So the upper level, this is where the uh, public comes in if they want to make a complaint or they have a uh, report request or something along those lines. Um, this is our, our secretary that would meet the public and then kind of direct the uh, the you know, the citizens on where they need to go. Okay. And you have a couple more offices and stuff back here? Yeah, we do. Um, so this is primarily like where our administration is. Um, this is just an open area. Um, we have the administrative uh, assistant who okay. assists the chief. Over here is the uh, chief's conference room. He can hold, you know, different kinds of meetings or, you know, squad, uh, okay. you know, things, stuff like that. So back in my day, getting called to the principal's office, that's where I'd go if I got called that's to the principal's office. Yeah, it can, can, be, can be the principal's <laughs> office. That's correct. And back here um, we have... We have another administrative office over here. This is for our, our uh, captain. Okay. Um, he's not here today, but... Um, and here's our uh, chief. And the chief is here. The chief's office. Mind if Absolutely. I talk to him real quick? Sure, you got it. All right. Hi, Chief. Thank hey. you for inviting us in. Sure. Thanks so much for coming in. All right. Appreciate I'm Mike it. from Heroes Next Door. Hi, Mike. Um, I want to say thank you once again for inviting us out. I heard the last couple of months you've been going through an accreditation program, which kind of delayed us getting in. <laughs> You're almost done with it. So can you tell us about what accreditation police department is? Sure. Um, when you're an accredited police department, it's a voluntary program that any law enforcement agency in Pennsylvania can participate in. It's run by the Pennsylvania Chiefs of Police. And as sort of a subcommittee, there's the Pennsylvania Law Enforcement Accreditation Commission. So they set up a bunch of standards, best practices, if you will, okay. that law enforcement agencies can comply with, and then they have to show proofs of compliance. Okay. Um, you get an initial accreditation assessment, and then every three years thereafter, assessors come back out, go through your files, go around the building. Basically, it's like an inspection. Okay. And make sure that we're following all the rules and regulations that we need to follow. Okay, okay, and that's a, a pretty big deal to get that done. It is. It, it, not every police department has to ha be accredited, is that correct? No, it, it's voluntary. Um, in Pennsylvania, there's roughly, don't quote me on this, over 1,100 police departments. Okay. And as of right now, there's only about 138, okay. 140 maybe police departments who are accredited. Okay, and what's so the benefit of being accredited? Well, it, it gives you us basically best practices to follow. Okay. Um, it helps make sure we're following all the laws of the Commonwealth that were mandated to follow as a police department. Okay. And also aside from that, it gives us again, best practices uh, for things such as use of force, evidence handling procedures, okay. handling of uh, people that we might arrest, okay. that they're taken care of properly when we detain them in our cell block, that they have all, everything that they need, you know, fresh water, air circulation, light, bedding, all those things. Okay. So uh, it just makes sure that we're, we're basically acting as a very professional police department. That's awesome. Thank you for doing that. We sure. appreciate that. And I believe well, we're going to run into some of your officers downstairs. We'll talk to them a little bit more. You have one officer that actually goes through the crediting process for you because she's kind of the administrative. Correct. We're going to really get into details with her, but I appreciate your time. I don't want to tie you up too much, so right. we're going to continue our tour. Thanks so much and good luck with everybody. All right. Thank you. All right.
So it's time to make our way from the chief's office downstairs to where all the work is being done. But we're coming back out in the lobby. We're going to run back into Tom. He's going to have to buzz us in for many different things. But what I want to point out real quick, uh, I was watching a video the other day of Firefighter Now. He talks about the 10 things that we do as firefighters and police officers. He talks about the safety uh, med drop box. Basically, when you have expired medications that you no longer need and stuff like that, you want to make sure that they're protected. You don't want to flush them down a the toilet. You don't want to, you know, give them away or anything like that. You want to get rid of them properly. The police station does that for them. That's pretty cool to have right here in the lobby. You can make it right through in without having to get buzzed in and drop off your old medications. That's awesome. All right, Tom, let's go. All right, let's see let's what we go. got. So what do we have down here? So this is uh, the public entrance. So this, this area here would be, uh, for instance, if somebody in the public wants to show up at our police department versus calling a 911 call in, uh, that would you know, make a, uh, like a standard report, you okay. know, i.e. being a, uh, like a fraud or some sort of scam. My bike scam. got stolen bike or something My bike got like stolen, that. yeah, excellent. Okay. So, you know, they would show up here. It's, a, it's, like I said, it's a public area where an officer can come out and meet and greet them, take the information, and then basically document their report. Okay, so we entered from upstairs in the main lobby where the township building is. That's correct. But you also have an entrance over here off the back side or the side of the building, right? We do, yes, that's correct. How do they get in over here? Can they walk so, right in? Yeah, there's, they can't walk in. It's, it's a secured entrance okay. uh, because it is coming into the police department area. Uh, basically what they would do is there is an intercom system out there. They would walk up, they would press the intercom. Um, if there's an officer on station, we can speak to them directly outside kind of get the gist of why they're here, okay. uh, you know, kind of screen the call, and then basically come out and greet them and take the report. Okay, and behind you, you have two interview rooms, it looks we like. We do, yeah. What are these, these for? So they are interview rooms. They're, they're called our soft interview rooms. And basically, as I explained, if a member of the public comes in and they want to make a report or they have different documents, you know, so on and so forth, we'll have an officer come out. Um, you know, we can have the, uh, you know, the citizen or the person being interviewed, you know, have a seat. It's a little more, you know, quiet area, a little more controlled. Okay. Um, they can give us any documents that they have that might be needed for the investigation. Okay. And, uh, you know, we can take the report and, and, and document it there. And now this room is pretty unique because you have cameras. You have a camera on you and it's mic'd. Why? That's correct. So there are at times that we will um, non-custodial interviews. Okay. Uh, so, for instance, if you're a suspect in a particular incident or there's been a crash and we need to do some further uh, interviewing, uh, you know, we can bring that person back to the station. They're not in custody. Uh, we can bring in, we can also u utilize those rooms as well. So we would come in, uh, we would, you know, introduce ourselves, get their uh, personal information. We would go live with our body cameras. These rooms are obviously being recorded as well. Okay. Uh, we notify them that everything's being recorded and that we can conduct the interview that way. That's awesome. Now, this is mainly because of COVID, right? That is, yeah. The, typically before COVID, pre-COVID, that wasn't there, but right. that's absolutely. we got to take the precautions. So absolutely. You know, I'm glad to see you're doing some of that stuff. you got hand sanitizer and the, the shield, yeah, we're shield guards. <laughs> All right. As we head back out here, we're going to start making our way basically into the police department. And, you know, when we first started talking, I didn't know how we could get in. How do I make my way into the police department? It's very specific, right? It is. So because uh, officers are working at their terminals, because they have access to different databases, uh, such as JNET, criminal history information, you know, potentially personal addresses, dates of birth, social security numbers, uh, different things like that. So it is a restricted area beyond this point. Okay. Uh, this, this is the general public access. So two different ways you can get beyond this point. One, you basically have to sign in on a visitor log and be escorted by a police officer, okay. or you have to be what's called CGIS cleared. Okay. That's, that's a requirement uh, for like our IT people, um, you know, different people, different contractors that are going to come into the building and work alone, okay. not in, you know, being accompanied by an officer. So it's like a, a security clearance kind of thing. It is. Yeah. So they have to be fingerprinted. They have to be, uh, you know, their fingerprints have to be processed. Right. Once they get that clearance, then they're allowed to operate or do different types of work within the building unaccompanied outside of this general public area. Okay, but today, where we're doing a station cribs, you're gonna accompany me. Uh, so I might see you on camera, but you're always with us. That's correct. All right, All right. can we take a look? Sure, absolutely. Okay, so our first stop, um, this is uh, Courtney Delaney. Hi, Courtney. Hello, Thanks nice for to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. Thanks for inviting us out. Uh, we did, had an opportunity to talk to the chief just a minute ago, and he's talking about accreditation. And I hear you have a pretty key role in regards to this accreditation process. I do, yes. Okay. Do. What does it mean by accredited? So accreditation um, is basically 
we have to follow like uh, different standards that are set like by the Commonwealth Plea Act. It's called. Okay. Um, and your job is to follow those rules or to make those rules. What my job isn't to make those rules. My job is to make sure that we, as a department as a whole, are following those rules okay. and we're staying within those standards. Okay. So my job is to make sure that I can offer those proofs, meaning show certain incidents. You okay. Know. So a lot of paperwork. Yes, it's everywhere. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, do you have a checklist that you follow? Like when I'm working on an ambulance, I have a checklist that the state gives out that, you know, I have to have so many Band-Aids, so many this, so many that. Is that kind of the same thing that you guys go through? Yes. So with the accreditation, um, we have to offer two proofs per year per standard per bullet. Okay. If that makes any sense. Okay. So um, certain standards are, there's a standard, say, for uh, making sure we're trained on the Crime Victims Act. So there's, I think there's six bullet points, excuse me, eight bullet points we have to go through. Okay. So we have to show that we were trained on that. Every officer here, we have to offer two proofs per year, okay. per assessment year. So there's three years in assessment. Okay. So right now we're going through a reassessment and then we'll start over again and be reassessed again in three years. So this is above and beyond you actually an officer. You actually go out on the streets too. Yes. Yeah, so um, my schedule is kind of flexes a little bit. So I do, I'm, a, I'm just a patrol officer here. Okay. And then I also assist, I do the accreditation. So I, okay. I'm actually on Sergeant Evans squad normally. Okay. So uh, how many hours do you put in in paperwork? Oh Lord. <laughs> um, some weeks, some weeks it's, I do strictly accreditation stuff. Some okay. weeks it's strictly patrol, so it varies. Right. It varies. Right. Yeah, paperwork is always the killer. Same yes. thing for EMS. Yes. So. Yes. So, uh, you guys have an awesome building here. We're going to continue to take a look. So we're going to keep working our way down. Thank okay. you for uh, talking to us. Thank you. All right. All right, Tom. What we got here? Absolutely. So let's uh, continue on. So in in this area here is kind of just some free space. Um, as you can see, we we uh, get our uniforms uh, laundered. Uh, okay. We have a service that comes, picks up our uniforms. Uh, we have, uh, they call it dry cleaning bags. So when the officers wear their uniforms at the end of their shift, they'll, you know, for instance, put their uniforms in the bag. Uh, we, you know, we have several uniforms. So we get a couple uniforms in the bag. The officers will come out, they'll place the bag at the bottom of the rack here. And then we have a cleaning service that actually comes to our station. They'll pick up the bags, they launder our uniforms, and then they have a return service as well. Okay. So they'll bring our uniforms back. Uh, we escort them in, obviously, and then they hang our uniforms up here. And then the What's the advantage of having a cleaning service? Why can't you just take your uniforms home? So it's basically, you know, to protect the material of the uniform. So the uniform manufacturer, the company recommends that they are dry cleaned. Okay. Um, you know, there's no policy saying we can't take our uniforms home to wash them. You know, but there's always a chance they're going to get mixed in with a different color. You know, uniforms could fade, you know, they could be exposed to bleach. Right. So it adds some consistency to our uniforms. Okay, you know, okay. So we yeah, know I mean, you look very professional in the way you are. Right. You know, I try to look as professional as I can, but I take my uniform home. Sure. These two started as the same color, so I understand why that is. And I think more EMFs and fire stations should do exactly what you guys are doing. It's, it's, it's a pretty nice service. I mean, it's, you yeah. know, it's, uh, yeah. It, it's, like I said, it's, it's convenient for the officers. Um, you know, it can't get any more convenient than dropping a bag and, you know, coming back, picking up a clean uniform. Right, right. Yeah, so. So behind me is what? So this is an NRAD system. What does uh, that this stand is, for? So it's a speed timing device. Um, every speed timing device that we deploy for any type of enforcement has to be approved by the state. Okay. So there's a Pennsylvania bulletin. Uh, it's a publication that's, that's put out by the state. And this is a very strict criteria of what type of speed timing device we can use. Okay. So these are calibrated. They're, they're calibrated. We have a company. Um, Cal that comes out and calibrates these in a certain amount of time frame, say in the standard. Right. So th this particular is uh, called an NRAS system. So it's basically like a two horse system. We would put a uh, one side on one side of the roadway and the other reader on the other side of the roadway. Okay. Uh, we do like a pretest uh, once the unit kind of calibrates in and of itself and kind of sets up. Um, it's a wireless system, which is very nice for us. Right. We can we can deploy this and then drive a substantial distance down the road. Uh, there's a head unit that we can monitor the speeds of the vehicles that actually pass through. Okay. Um, you know, if there's a violation, then you know we can we can pull out and enforce it. So. Okay. Uh, so it's a very nice tool. Do you use it for like for road studies to see if you need stop signs or, or change speed limits and things like that? Uh, we we can. We have some other devices that monitor speed and and track speed of vehicles. This doesn't necessarily record that information. Okay. This is more for like an enforcement purpose. So okay. if we get a complaint on. You know, X, Y, and Z road, you know, uh, you know, specifically that they have a speed complaint. We can go out, we can set this device up, you know, we can put some patrol cars in the area. Like I said, it's a wireless system, so it works really great. 
we don't necessarily have to be necessarily in the area of this okay. device. Very cool. So we can be down the road as a, as a car traverses through it. We get the average speed, and then you know if it's a violation, we stop. All right. The rest of the building on the bottom side on this, you have an office next to us. Whose office is we this? We do. We have our last uh, command staff office. Okay. Um, this is the office of patrol lieutenant. Okay. And uh, so his his office is the only command staff administrator that's actually on this lower level. Okay. Yeah, we covered the captain's office and the chief office upstairs. Okay. So basically, the, these two rooms here, kind of moving down to the end of the hall, these are basically just storage areas. Right. Um, we store some equipment in there, some miscellaneous files. Uh, we have some excess equipment, some old belts, uniforms, you know, things like that. And then basically, just to end the hallway here is our traffic safety office. Okay. So there's a whole separate department to do traffic safety. Yeah, we have a unit, a, a traffic safety unit. So currently we have two officers assigned to the traffic safety unit. Okay. And they're, they're designated primarily to do, you know, set that NRAD system up, um, to handle any type of complaints that come into the township or the police department for, like you said, uh, you know, the, the stop sign, the repeat stop sign, right. or your cars consistently running uh, red lights at a particular intersection. We would then forward uh, those complaints to these particular officers and then they would go out and address it. Now, later, I think we're going to look at some of your vehicles as we walk through. You know, I've been traveling around and I've seen a lot of different vehicles. I see sure. the traffic units. So hopefully we can do a station rigs of those. So yeah, absolutely. All right. Sounds good. All right. All right. Let's make our way down back this way. OK, you got it. Real quick, I want to take a pause here and let the audience know that, you know, this is someone's office. And even though it looks industrial, you got the you know, open ceilings and stuff like that. It's very modern industrial. You guys are people. You guys are human beings just like us, you know, Absolutely. and, you know, bringing into your own office, having some of your own things makes it feel more home. You guys, you know, spend just as much time in an office or a, a business that we do uh, as far as firefighters. So, you know, just like everybody else, you guys are people. And I want to make sure that the audience understands that. Yeah, you're in uniform. Yeah, you have some authority to, you know, for different things. Uh, but you know, you have kids, you have wives, you have girlfriends and boyfriends and all those different kind of things. And bringing it into an office is pretty cool to see. All right, come on out this way, Mike. So Tom, before we move on, you know, we got a lot of pictures of us talking, but behind us, we have a bunch of plaques. Can you tell me a little bit more about those? We do, sure, yeah. So we like to recognize uh, some of our past officers, some of our accomplishments. Uh, you know, and things along those lines. So uh, I'll be just start right behind you. Okay. So right here, uh, Chief Benson actually, you know, initiated this program, which was, which was great. He went back and, and researched some of the past officers of the year. Okay. Um, so we have this plaque to, you know, put on display uh, the officers that, you know, are currently in past, you know, in the agency that have, have received that accolade. So right, that's, that's, right. that's really nice. Now you have a bunch of pictures. Are these pretty much your staff on? Now? Yeah, so these, these these are like, you know, the, uh, you know, traditional baseball card, yeah, you yeah. know, so each officer, you know, when they're hired, you know, the, the, you know, the township likes them to get a baseball card. We have okay. some mottos and sayings on the back and we use them for, you know, handouts to small children at community events. That's awesome. You know, we're on different calls and stuff like that. You know, we just hand them out. Yeah. So yeah. it works out great. And you got, uh, yeah. So this was a district attorney's accommodation, uh, back in 2016. Um, so this was something uh, by past district, district attorney Tom Hogan. So he gave the agency. Right. And then uh, moving on here. So 25 years or more of service. These wow. are retired officers. You know, so our, our typical retirement, our standard is 25 years. Okay. Um, okay. So, you know, we're very fortunate, you know, to have officers, you know, spend that much time here right. at the agency. And, that tells you, you know, something about the career. agency. You know, having Absolutely. turnover is huge. EMS is turning over a lot. Fire departments, not so much. You know, do you get a lot of turnover in the police department? Uh, not really. No, we're very fortunate. So, you know, we, we've been able to really maintain our force. That's awesome. You know, so it's, it, it's been nice. It creates a lot of continuity within our agency, um, you know, and a lot of friendships and things like that. You don't like to lose. Right, right. And behind me. So lastly, yeah, dogs, yeah. Um, these were two canine units that we had. Uh, this, unfortunately, they have both, uh, you know, since passed. Uh, this was canine Benny, as you can see, he was in service from 1996 to 2010. Okay. And his handler is actually Captain uh, Matthew Herkner. Okay. So at the time he was, uh, you know, a canine officer and canine Benny was uh, patrol trained and he was also uh, cross-trained in narcotics. Okay. So if we had any type of vehicle sniff or, you know, any, anything like that, right. um, you know, he was a huge benefit. Okay. And then uh, again, past K-9 Caesar, he was with an officer who has since retired. He's no longer with the agency. Okay. And Caesar was in service from 1999 to 2012. Wow. So Caesar was, 
uh, very similar to K9 Bentley in, in the patrol aspect. Okay. But his specialty was uh, explosives. Okay. You know, so we get the typical, you know, bomb threat at, at a particular business. Right. He was a great tool. Right. You know, right. we could put him in there and he would do a Looking you know, at his years of service, too, you know, that's right around 9 11. You know, time. It was. So, you know, it we was. had some of those calls and, and we I did. remember him going out to the schools and, and, and taking a look. I appreciate it. Yeah, so. that's something good to bring up. You know, I, I, I do remember I was obviously here, you know, at the time and, and post 9 11. Yeah. It was not uncommon for us to get calls of, you know, suspicious packages and, you know, people were, you know, very on high alert. Right. Yeah. They're great tools. Um, you know, we currently don't have any canine units, but, you know, I was fortunate enough to work here with them and, they were they were excellent. All right. Talk. Now you got a whole lot more of this building to see. Yeah, we do. All right, let's go take we a look. Do. All right, let's take a look. All right, Mike. Continuing on, buddy. All right. So coming out of the uh, the area where you know citizens would come in to make a report, uh, we're actually into like a more secure area of the uh, the police department. So this is the meat and potatoes of the police department. Yeah, pretty much. This is uh you know where everything kind of takes place. This is uh which, which we'll show you. You know the patrol supervisor's office. Uh, CID, uh, you know, the supervisor for the criminal unit, okay. um, you know, the squad room where the officers do the reports and stuff like that. So You're an active police department. I see the sign on the door already. Yeah, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to access this office right now. One of our detectives is doing a uh, doing an interview. Okay. But this office right over here, this is for the uh, detective sergeant. Okay. Um, so he's the uh, he supervises our, our uh, criminal unit. Okay. Um, so there's a detective sergeant and then three uh, three detectives you know assigned to that particular unit. Okay. And this is the detective's office. Yeah. This is the this is the detective office. So this is where the criminal investigators uh, have their office, do their paperwork, do their follow ups, you know, make you know phone calls and stuff like that. Right. Right. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, you got a lot of cool stuff in here. Again, I want to make sure that the audience knows that. Yeah, you're officers, but you are also human beings. You're, you know, the guy next door and having, you know, signed baseballs and, you know, some of the pictures up on the walls brings it back to, yeah, I got to go to work, but I want to bring some of my home here. Yeah, it does. Yeah. So you don't have bunks like, you know, the firehouses that we see, yep. but you guys spend a lot of time here. Yeah, we do. What kind of shifts do you guys want to run? So we worked uh, primarily in patrol. We work a 12 hour shift. Okay. Um, so the sergeant on the shift and the second in command on the shift worked a 6A the 6P shift or a 6P to 6A shift. Okay. Um, and then there's two other officers assigned to that particular patrol squad, and they're a 7A to 7P or a 7P to 7A. Okay. So basically it breaks down to like a two week rotation. Okay. So two weeks of, of a day shift, which would typically be that 6A to 6P. Okay. Um, and then uh, after that two week day shift rotation, then we go to a two week night rotation. Right. And okay. it would be the other or the opposite 12 hours. How do you shift. feel about going from nights to days, days to nights? Is that hard on you guys? It, it, it is at times. Okay. Um, you know, every officer is a little bit different. You know, our, our age is, you know, different. It affects us all a little bit differently. Some officers really enjoy day shift. Some officers really get into night shift. The right. work is different. Right. Um, you know, so there is a, there is a difference. Um, is it a quick turnaround? but we do it is we are fortunate with that 12-hour rotation look they're long days right but we do have a lot of middle days and we do have an opportunity to take a couple days off you know to get that week off okay so i would say you know majority speaking if if we had to take a poll i think the officers would definitely just give a thumbs up for the 12-hour shifts that's awesome yeah. going into the absolutely room here so this is our uh general squad room area okay the officers on duty you know we will exchange various equipment uh, you know, at shift change, you know, they'll gather, change their batteries and their portables, get their car keys, get, you know, some different uh, patrol equipment that we cameras? need. Cameras? Yep. Okay. Yep. There's a kiosk right down there that we assign body cameras. Okay. You know, coming on duty. So this is where an officer has an opportunity to come back. It's a safe environment. You know, if they do get that arrest or they have some reports to follow up on, some phone calls to make. This is the general, you know, patrol area where those officers have an opportunity to come back right. and do that follow. So this is also where you do the shift change, the oncoming yes. shift and offcoming shift. Call come in here, almost that that roll call that I see on television, right. kind of right. thing. Right. This is where that typically, you know, takes place. Okay. The sergeant or the supervisor coming off duty, you know, will provide a very short brief of that shift's activities. Let them know that anything's going to come back on them, you know, some, you know, things that maybe to keep an eye on, okay. uh, you know, things of that nature. So, like I said, this is this is where like the meats and potatoes of patrol is. Like, right. This is where it all takes place. Okay. If we get that arrest, you know, we have that paperwork, we have that follow up. Officers are coming here. It's an opportunity for them to hang out and you know get their work done. All right. These two officers are on, particularly on my squad. Okay. Um, so you know they're they're over there typing away, trying to document some calls. That's right. Keep up on the yeah, work. Absolutely. All right. Behind us is another office. Yep. This is the um, this is the sergeant's office. Okay. And basically, we have four 
uh, patrol sergeants. Okay. Uh, it's broken down. Patrol is four patrol sergeants, and then you know, as we talked about, we have the one detective sergeant. So our agency has uh, five sergeants currently. So this office here is is uh, specifically for the patrol sergeants and the opposite sides of the rotation. So we have two sergeants that are assigned to this desk here, and two sergeants that are assigned to this desk here. Okay. It's a, it's a nice you know if we need to talk to an officer about something. Um, you know, we have the doors, you know, we can kind of shut that and speak in private. Right. Um, you know, or if we need to make, a, you know, a specific phone call, you know, or something along those lines. Right. So right. it's an area, but, you know, you know, pretty much, you know, we keep a, you know, an open door policy, keep an eye on patrol and, um, you know, make sure, you know, things are on smooth. Yeah. I like the, how big it is. It's nice and clean and organized. It, like I said, it has that modern industrial feel in here. Sure. So it's very cool. Sure. Yeah, continuing on, Mike. Okay, real quick before yeah. we go, I see you're working on a weight room back here? Yeah, we are. Um, our detective sergeant, uh, Jason Madormo, he's been kind of really piling this program, doing a great job. Okay. Um, it's it's new. It's it's not 100% in service yet, but we're, we're definitely working on it. It's definitely important for us. Right. You know, we do a lot of station cribs, and every firehouse that we go to has, you know, bigger and better weight rooms, yeah. stuff like that. They talk about the physical fitness and mental fitness. It's no different for a police officer yeah, it's to extremely stay physically important. fit. So yeah. it's cool that you guys are we're working on it. Yeah, we're getting it done. All right, well, next room we're going to go into is going to be the... Yeah, this, so this is a, like a multi-purpose room. This is a, we kind of labeled it the roll call room. We don't have a, you know, per se roll call, but you know, we typically use it for uh, in-house department training. Okay. I teach some of our, uh, you know, our curriculums here in the agency. And, uh, you know, it's, it really works well. You know, right. we can get a couple squads in here. We can do the training. We also have, in the past, hosted outside departments okay. um, or outside training. You know, we've brought, you know, you know, various different departments in here to attend the training. And one of the other things we use this room for, if we get, like, an active incident or there's an incident under investigation, we used it for, you know, long-term, you know, missing juveniles or missing people. Okay. You know, if we have to put together, like, a pre-plan for something, right. you know, we've, we've actually utilized this room. Some of the... You know the washboards or the overheads. Yeah, and, you got an overhead you know, screen that drops down. Or, yeah, stuff like that. So it's, it's a multi-purpose room, but it's it, it's a nice space. It really works well. All right, all right. I've been waiting. Let's go take a look at these cells. All right, let's do it. Okay, Tom. We are now in the cell area, but this is right. a very specific room. What is this about? So we we call it the live scan room. Really, it's our our what you really refer to it as like the processing room. Right? Okay. So when we uh, if if we are required to take somebody into custody. There are certain criteria with different arrests that they have to be processed. Not all arrests have to be, but in the event that they do have to be processed, and I say processed meaning you know, a fingerprint and photograph. Okay. So we would come into a secured Sally Port area. The patrol cars uh, can pull into our building. You know, we safely uh, unload you know, the person, male or female, bring them into this particular area, and this is where that processing takes place. Okay. So this unit right here, this instrument is a um, inkless, fingerprint system that's really hooked up to the FBI in the state. Okay. I'm okay. sure you remember like long ago, Yeah. you know, we're dealing with the dirty ink and, you know, things like that. So we've really progressed in technology. Right. You know, they came up with this. This is called the live scan machine. Okay. You know, or instrument. And uh, it, it makes it really nice. Right. You know, so it's all electronic fingerprints. You know, they're scanned right into the system, and then we can we can shove that right off to the right. State. So for EMS aspect of it, I get fingerprinted every two years. I got to have that child abuse, uh, FBI clearance, uh, uh, criminal history stuff. That's what you're doing right here. That's exactly what we're doing. So now for me, it takes two weeks to get it back in the mail and get results. You guys are instantaneous. Several minutes. Wow. Yeah, pretty much instantaneous. Okay. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a pretty quick process. So couple things we're doing, we're actually recording the arrest. Okay. You know, if it's something like I said, if if it is a violation that needs to be processed and we're actually, you know, those charges, those particular charges will be immediately assigned to that person's criminal history. Okay. The other thing we're doing, you know, by checking their fingerprints, we can verify who they are. Right. Right. So these are our, you know, our unchangeable prints of who we are. Right. So if we have a situation where, you know, we might necessarily be getting the truthful information, we can identify them as well. Okay. The other thing we do is a, is a record check. This will, you know, show us whether they're on, you know, probation or parole or if they're wanted, you know, in-state or out-of-state, really. Okay. I mean, it's, you know, it's a really great tool. That's cool. It's nice to have it all connected and, and ready to go. Absolutely. So back here is where you take the camera pictures. It is, yeah. So this is... Do you is, guys uh, still use the old uh, numbers that you hold up and, uh, you no, know, no, turn left, No, no number turn right. cards. Actually, you know, it's funny <laughs> you say that because when I first started at West Whiteland, we did have a card. Okay. So it had their name on it, you know, what they were arrested for, the date. Okay. You know, and they stood there with the card. Right, so, right. No, this we the, pretty this much... the one thing I think of, you know, when we're watching TV or right. different channels, they always have those cards, turn left, turn right. Yeah. Uh, so we do. Uh, you know, all the jewelry has to be taken, you know, off, okay. you know, the individual before the process, you know, before the pictures, 
Obviously, with COVID, we have our, you know, remove the COVID mask. Right. You know, it lights up a little bit. You know, we okay. take, uh, you know, some front photographs and then some side photographs. So we still do the, you know, the different angle photographs. Okay. Yeah, so that, that's pretty much stay consistent. Okay, and looking around here, you have another machine in the corner, obviously a printer, but what's this machine? We do. So this is for uh, DUIs. Okay. Um, this particular instrument is called the Intoxilizer 9000. Okay. Um, officers have to go through some extensive training to use this instrument. I, I believe it's about a week-long school. Okay. So not every officer here is certified to use it. In the event that we do get a, a DUI or an incident involving alcohol, this instrument, you provide two breath samples. Okay. You know, the, the defendant or the person provides two breath samples. And the reading that this instrument provides is an actual BAC, which is their blood alcohol concentration. Okay. So I, I'm sure you know, you know, when we do a DUI stop, or we pull somebody out of a car, it's called a PBT. It's okay. a preliminary breath test. Okay. Um, basically, that unit is just to show the presence of alcohol. That particular reading necessarily doesn't really carry over much as far as the, the criminal prosecution end. Okay. That reading we really can't use necessarily. But it gives but you a good inclination of, yeah, we need to take this further or it not. Does. Kind of thing. Yeah. It's it's a tool. Yeah. It's a tool. It's a reference, like I said, it's to consolidate or to prove the impairment that we saw is is absolutely alcohol related. Okay. But then this instrument here, you know, the results that we get for this are are definitely used in court. Okay. Okay. Now do you do blood draws also? We do, we do. So if it's a non-alcohol related arrest, okay. uh, you know, let's say for example, like a uh, controlled substance or drugs, you know, then we do have to do a blood draw. Okay. So the same process, Right. Uh, nothing really changes. They'll come back, they'll get fingerprinted and photographed, and then we call an outside, a local ambulance agency that we have an agreement with. Okay. And the ambulance will come here. There was obviously, you know, tons of paperwork and right. we have to sign off on. Right. And they'll actually, you know, perform the blood draw right here, which is great. Right, right. Yeah, I'm on that side of it. I've done that a couple of times uh, at the hospital. So we you have very specific procedures how to do that too. So it's nice that you have an agency that'll come down and help yeah, you out. Yeah, it, it makes it really nice. So. It's, we, we can do everything in-house. So we can do the blood draw right here, you know, obviously with the local EMS assistance. And then, you know, if it's an alcohol related case, you know, we use this particular instrument here to get a BAC. Okay, so I've been arrested I, or detained and I've sure. gone through process. Where do you put me next? So it depends. That, okay. That's a good question. All right. So it depends. If it's a situation where, you know, they're going out to Chester County Prison, where okay. they're going to be here maybe for a little bit of time, or waiting on a transport, and or it's a situation where they might be waiting on a ride. You know, their ride might be coming from a different state. Okay. So it might be a half hour, 45 minutes, we're waiting on a ride. Okay. So we have some uh, temporary cells, okay. a temporary holding area. Okay. And that's, uh, we'll walk over, I'll show you one of those. Okay. All right, Mike. So this is, um, this is cell number five, okay? So this is basically one of five holding cells that we have here at West Whiteland. Okay. Um, so this would be an area that is, is very temporary for the person. This isn't jail, this isn't a county prison. Um, we, don't, we don't house individuals here. They're not sentenced to here. This is very temporary. Okay. So some situations where, you know, like I had indicated before, they're waiting on a ride. Um, you know, the ride might be coming from, you know, Delaware or New Jersey. We've had situations like that. Okay. Um, another example is, you know, if, if, if the individual is wanted on a warrant, that warrant might precipitate them being taken out to the prison. Okay. So uh, a lot of times we solicit some assistance from, you know, the state and local constables. Um, you know, a lot of times those guys and girls are busy, so we have to, there's some downtime in between. Right. So this is, this is very temporary. Yeah, and when I'm looking around this, it's, it's a very sterile environment, so they're very safe in here. Uh, there's, you know, you got somewhere to sit down or lay down if you want. You got a toilet, sink, water, everything that yes. you need. You know, and when I pictured a holding cell, I pictured the old cell bars and that kind of stuff. Right. You know, they've pretty much gotten rid of most of those kind of things, and they have cell doors. But how do you monitor them then? So what we do is we, we have a, uh, a policy where before we put anybody into the cell, we check the cell. Okay. We make sure there's no debris in here, there's no controlled substance, no contraband, no weapons, you know, things like that, things of that nature. So once we put the person in, they, they have to, they're, they're going to fit into a couple different categories. A normal arrest that's not under the influence of any type of intoxicant or narcotics um, is basically like falls into like a 30 minute check standard. Okay, so but, maybe I stole the vacuum and you caught me stealing the vacuum. Right, exactly. Okay. Right, if you're not under the influence of everything, it would be a 30 minute physical check. Okay. But in addition to the physical check from our squad room, we have cameras in here. We also have audio. Okay. okay so we can, we can pull these individual or multiple cells up 
from our squad room where it showed you officers doing the reports. Okay. So we have the ability to go out there and not only monitor them visually, but audio as well. Okay. So we can we can look and listen. Right. right? So, so if there's if an issue, help, we can immediately I respond. I don't have to scream at you because you're not right in front of me. I can just say something and you're going to pick me up. We would hear it. That's awesome. Right. So it's all, like I said, it's audio, visually uh, recorded okay. and monitored, okay. which is the most important thing. Yeah. If something happens, if we see or hear something, we can immediately respond back here and address it. Okay. Um, if everything's staying status quo, then it kind of falls into that 30 minute check where an officer will, will physically come back and, and check that right. person. Right, right. How many of these do you have? So we have five. Okay. Yeah, we have five. Okay. Do you normally fill them all up or is it? No, I mean, it's, it's rare, you know, fortunately, you know, that we're filling all five. Okay. There's some different standards, you know, in, in a situation, I'll give you an example, like where we arrest uh, like a male and a female. So we have, you know, by policy, we have to separate them by sound and, and, and you know, audio too, okay. uh, sound and sight. So, oh, wow. um, you know, we have a, a divider door here that's, you know, that's kind of blocked, blocked off. So for instance, we would put the male in one cell and a female, you know, in another holding cell so they can't communicate and or, you know, see each other. Right. So it, it, it works well. Yeah, a lot of policies. Oh yeah. <laughs> so how do you get them into this park? So, you know, I was out on the streets, you caught me stealing a vacuum, I got arrested. And where do I come into the building? Do I, I don't come in through your patrol room. I come no, in through, come in through the patrol room. So you know, obviously they're being transported back by back, by back, you know, by an officer. Okay. Um, the officer has fob access into a uh, a large uh, metal roll up door that goes into um, you know what we call our sally port. Okay. All right. That's a Can we go take a look at that? Sure. Absolutely. All right. So now we're in your sally port. This is where I would initially be taken in. This, this door would go up. You drive me in. I'm in the back of your squad car. You park here. What's the process? So the process is when we have a prisoner, you, you're exactly right. So it's key fob access. The patrol car pulls in. We wait till the roll-up door goes down. You know, so it's a very secure environment for for not only us, but you know, for the safety of the prisoner as well. Right. It also um, gives me a little privacy. Maybe I'm embarrassed about what absolutely. I just did, kind of thing. So having two doors is pretty cool. Right. We are required before we get any any prisoner or any transport person out of the patrol vehicle that we have two officers here. Okay. This area is also cameraed as well. Um, again, this would be a situation where we would leave our body cameras on. You okay. Know, so we're recording, you know, by a multitude of different uh, devices here, you know, both visually and audio. Um, so once we get to two officers here, our standard procedure would be we would download all of our weapons, uh, you know, including our pistol, okay. our magazines, our expandable batons, OC spray, taser, everything, knives, any any weapon at all. So we would secure them before we get the uh, the person out of a car. Okay. Okay. So these are the these are the lockers that we that we would do to you right. know secure the officers' weapons. Okay. Once we are secured and once it's a safe environment. Then we'd go to the patrol car, we'd ask them to, to exit. Um, once they exit, then we would actually check the interior of the patrol car. Okay. So we do pre-shift inspections. Yeah. And we also inspect, you know, as soon as we would remove somebody from the car. Okay. So we do a secondary, obviously at the scene is our primary search. That's a very thorough search, but we do a secondary search here as well. Right. So after we perform our secondary search, we also use this uh, handheld uh, it's kind of like a metal detector. Yeah. You know, it's very similar to the ones that the sheriffs would use getting into a court or right. going through an airport. Or the bouncers at the clubs. Or the bouncers at the club. <laughs> so basically, you know, it, it turns on. I can use this kind of demo there. Right. Pick up any any metal on the person's body. Okay. So if if it is a situation where they do have something concealed, if an officer did miss something on that primary or secondary search, okay. you know, that's metal based, we would be able to pick it up with this device. So, nice. which is huge. All right. Again, so, the whole point of this is to make you safe as an officer, because you're trying to serve the public and to make whoever's in custody absolutely. safe. Absolutely. You know, it's not about punishment at this time. It's about safety. Right. Okay. Absolutely. And these lockers, what are these for then? So these are these are temporary um, property storage or and or evidence storage. Okay. So uh, you know, I'll give you an example: a female with a pocketbook, or a male with a suitcase, or has different belongings, wallet, keys. Okay. Um, you know, different things of that nature. So we would collect those at the scene at the time of the arrest. Right. Because we want to separate their property from them during transport. Okay. So once we get back here, we need to. We don't want to leave it in our cars. So we we would take it out of our cars. Um, we have evidence bins that are in our patrol cars, which when we do our cars later, you okay. know, we can show you. Yeah. So those evidence bins and then the property is basically being recorded, okay. obviously, at a later time. We'll inventory that property. We'll write everything down. You okay. know, we'll count money on video. Everything's being recorded. So we have the ability. These lockers, they basically just open up. There's a lock inside with a key. Has like this little handy uh, 
you can put these around your wrist. Right. So typically, we'd put their property in here, we close this up, you know, we'd lock the, uh, lock, the locker, we record locker number two, we okay. maintain this key, right. and if and when the individual's released or yep. they're transported to a different facility, okay. they verify their property, they sign off on it, you know, to, you know, to keep it. It's all about accountability. Yeah, accountability, keep it consistent. Right. So we're recording it, they're acknowledging it, they're right. double checking it, they're signing off on, they're, they're getting everything back, Right. and then, you know, they're on their way. Right, so very it's, cool that's, way to do that's that. way it works. Awesome. All right, so I hear you have another room that's kind of like this, it's got another sally port, but that's used differently. It is used differently, yeah. So we don't um, bring anybody into that. Okay. Um, it's not necessarily a, a sally port or a garage that we would take a prisoner into. Okay. Um, th this is the sole purpose of this area here. Okay. So this area would be more for a storage, you know, for seizing a vehicle or seizing something large in nature. Okay. We would use this particular storage area as like an interim you know, like I said, to apply for a search warrant or do okay. some different processing and things like that. Okay. Can we take a look at that? Absolutely. All right, let's go take a look. All right, you got it. All We're right. talking about the other Sally port, so this is, uh, this is that area. Okay. And who do we have here? So this is uh, Scott Peasy. He's one of our uh, detectives. Yes, sir. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for inviting us in. Thanks for having me. So this is kind of your territory a little bit, different right. than over there. Right. Okay. You are a detective here. Yes. So correct. what is this area used for? So we call this the CID garage. It's a criminal investigation division garage. So okay. um, what we typically do if we seize a car, reference to a crime, and we want to get a search warrant for it, we have it towed into here. And then we apply for a search warrant. Once we get that search warrant, we search the car. Okay. Now, can you just, what, that warrant, is it very specific? Or can you just kind of tear door cards apart like I see on it, TV? It's usually very specific. So when we get a search warrant, what we have to do is fill out the application for search warrant. We send it to the district attorney's office. And they t give us guidance on what they want in there and how they want it written. Okay. And then once that is issued we t send it to the judge and the judge would sign it and then then we go there but but okay. the limitations it's not open-ended um you know depending on the crime they'll tell you you know this parents will tell you what you're allowed to search for and what you're allowed to retrieve from that vehicle okay so you know one of the scenarios that i've been talking to tom about is you know i robbed a local store and i stole a vacuum right and now it's in the trunk of my car you're not going to go in the front of my car are you you're just going to go into the trunk it, it would all depend on the situation. I mean, just because the one vacuum, yes. If if we didn't have any information that they went, if we knew specifically it went into the trunk of the car, okay. we probably would only be allowed to search the trunk. Okay. Um, it's not unusual, so to so the type of things, but right. typically when you search a car, you, you, you could be listing different things. And what you, another thing you listen, list on there is uh, ownership. Okay. Because not only do you want to know who's driving the car and where the item is, but who owns the car? Okay. So that gives shows a little more guilt or whatever for the person involved. Okay. Now, specifically in this Sally Port, you have a couple different things. I see you have some bikes for yes. a bike team. Yes. You have a cage. What's the cage for? That's not a so, dog cage. No. So um, if somebody were, if, if our officers were to recover some merchandise, now we deal with a lot of retail crimes. So they may recover, you'd be surprised how much stuff somebody could put in a car. So you re recover all that evidence. Okay. And during the weekend or at night, they'll put it in there, they'll lock it, and then they'll put the key in an evidence locker okay. where, where only I can get to it. Um, so that's what that is for, that, that type of reason. Okay, and this behind us is? This is a drying cabinet. Um, we use this. Luckily, we don't have to use it too often, but what it does is it dries things, obviously. So if we're dealing with blood evidence, things along those lines, we'll put it in there, dry it, and then we can package it up and put it in the evidence okay. room. But we can't put wet, stuff in the evidence room for obvious reasons. Okay, okay. Yeah, because it will get contaminated. It'll get contaminated, and it'll stink, and uh, yeah, all that. But okay. that's what that's for. Um, and we and there's a hose on the side, so we can take it outside, we can rinse it out because of the body fluids or whatever may be in there. Right, right. So that, that's right. that, yes. So it's nice to have an area like this. You know, it's not a big area, but it's a big enough to fit a car, fit a truck, right. uh, and, and get your work done out of the weather. You're not doing it on the side of a road right. or anything like that. Right, there's heat and air in here, yeah, right. exactly. Right, right, So we appreciate what you guys are doing, you know, and uh, you know, being the detective for the department is yes. a, 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 obviously a huge job. So, yeah. you know, we thank you for that. Thank you for inviting us out and taking a look at your house. Yeah, absolutely, we're so, happy to have you. Once again, this is Heroes Next Door. We just did a station cribs with the police department. So do us a favor, hit that subscribe, hit that notification so we can keep bringing you more.